updates are in listen-only mode. Yes, welcome to the today's webinar, DCMI ACES joint webinar on schema.org. Um, this is the part one of a two-part uh, webinar. And I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Richard Wallace, um, an independent consultant who has been involved with Semantic Web for over 20 years. Uh, he's the chair of two W3C uh, community groups, uh, Schema Bib Extend and Schema Archetypes. And um, he's generally an, an evangelist for the adoption of uh, linked data in, cult, um, in cultural heritage and um, in the wider web. Um, he uh, is known for giving, giving very entertaining talks, so um, I'm looking forward to this today. Uh, he currently works with OCLC, with Google, and uh, with the banking industry on extending and applying schema.org. And um, he's um, um, described as um, a pragmatist who believes in searching for implementable solutions. So um, over to you, Richard. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Tom. Uh, welcome to this um, webinar, as, as Tom just said. Um, just to place things in, uh, in context, I, um, you, you might like a feeling of who I am. I'm, I'm told this is a reasonable likeness, but uh, who am I to comment? But uh, it, um, it kind of indicates who you're listening to. Don't worry, I'll take it down in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Just to give a little bit of background, um, as Tom said, I'm an independent consultant and, and uh, founder of Data Liberate, which is all about liberating the value in data that we have all stored in our organisations to make the best use of it for our own benefit. Uh, chair of the Schema Bib Extend W3C Community Group, uh, as Tom mentioned, um, Schema.org for bibliographic data and the new bib.schema.org extension is under our remit. I'm also chair of bibliograph.net, which I'll explain again later on, which is another bibliographic initiative associated with schema.org extension. Recently formed is the Schema Archetypes W3C community group. This was aimed to do for archives what we've done for bibliographic data. Fairly new group, uh, only just started the conversation. Uh, and currently, I'm working um, with clients with Google. I part-time work with Google on their schema.org site, uh, the schema.org vocabulary, and in ex uh, enabling the extension and encouraging the extension uh, of, of that vocabulary. Uh, work with OCLC, um, uh, advising and presenting uh, on, on, on their behalf. OCLC were my employers. I was a technology evangelist there for three years up until recently and also working with the financial industry who are looking to apply schema.org in a way to share information about financial products from banks, insurance companies, etc. Those are the main things. Uh, plenty of other things going on in the background as, um, and as one must say in this sort of environment, always looking for opportunities to do more. But we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about schema.org. Um, what is it? Where does it come from? Why should it be interesting? What's relevant, etc.? So let's pop back in history a little bit to a blog post on the 2nd of June 2011 from Google announcing an initiative from Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Uh, that, that, in its own right, was a bit of a surprise, those three cooperating. And actually, very rapidly afterwards, um, the Russian search engine company, Yandex, uh, started to become part of this initiative as well. It was all about providing structured markup uh, for people to describe resources on the web focused on uh, enabling rich snippets in, uh, in uh, web page search results. Um, they, they identified some general purpose properties to describe um, um, things like creative works, books, uh, movies, music recordings, TV information, uh, embedded objects like audio and image and video objects, uh, things like events, which everybody wants to know about, promote, organizations we want to describe, persons we want to talk about, uh, places and uh, local businesses. In fact, local business um, is a combination of a place and an organization. Specialized versions of that, things like a restaurant, 
products uh, and offers around products fitting in with the commercial world on, on, on the web and then some of the social stuff review and aggregate review. And as I said, the main driver was to uh, power uh, rich snippets, rich snippets being a way of taking structured information provided by uh, the publisher of the web page that embeds Schema.org um, to have a better looking result in the search results page. Um, doesn't really make any difference to where you're placed in the search results and in fact the search engines continue to emphasize that structured data doesn't necessarily affect your placing in a set of search results. But with that structured data, they can provide, as you can see here from this not very appetizing looking green mango salad uh, here, you can provide sort of, um, reviews and ratings and structured information and, and images to improve the, the look of your result on the website. That has twofold benefits. One, as a provider of data and a provider of services and products, people are more liable to click on your results. Uh, but as a consumer of information, it, it, it's providing, in a very similar size space to a traditional result, more information and more interactive environment. So, schema.org, uh, what is it? Well, it's a linked data vocabulary um, in, in its simplest terms. It's uh, constructed from RDF, uh, for those that are aware of RDF, um, the, the triples uh, format of describing data. It's made up from URIs and string values, and it has types um, and properties and enumeration, types equivalent to uh, classes in some vocabularies, properties similar to attributes, and enumerations, a set of um, uh, available values that you can use when marking up your data. Now, this was targeted at the web industry, the webmasters building uh, web pages and adding value to them, not the structured ontological science world of um, um, strongly managed data, data formats, etc. So it's, it's what I would call not a strongly typed vocabulary. It's, it's fairly loose in its constraints. It tries to have as few constraints as possible. So for instance, in the traditional uh, RDF vocabulary, you may have constraints built into it with domain and range statements insisting what uh, class or type a property could appear on, what, uh, what uh, values that property could reference. Um, in schema.org, they have the same concept, but it's more loosely defined. So it says the range of a property includes the, the type that's referenced. It doesn't, doesn't narrow you down to having to use those types. It's more advisory than restrictive. Similarly, uh, <coughs> domain includes doesn't uh, force you to use properties on a particular type. Um, so that uh, webmasters can uh, Im embed this data in their websites, uh, they're offered three serializations for that data using microdata or RDFA or JSON-LD. Syntactically subtly different, the source of many religious wars on mailing lists about which is the best, but the actual data and the, uh, and the way it's structured is identical in all three. So it's a web vocabulary to describe stuff, um, a general vocabulary not focused on any particular industry or so sector, a vocabulary for def defining and describing most things you will find on the web. The core type is a thing and there is nothing wrong with describing something as a thing with a name and, uh, a, a ex and a description, etc., if there isn't a particular type available for that thing. So that's, that's where the vocabulary came from, that's how it's structured, we'll look a little bit more deeply into it later on, um, and, and, and it was out there to drive rich snippets. But why it's interesting is because of some other developments on the web. About a year later, uh, something called the knowledge graph appeared in our consciousness. This uh, is another blog post from, from Google introducing the knowledge graph, talking about things, not strings, identifying entities with their, their attributes 
out on the web and the relationships between them. The, the first visible uh, sign of this was something that they actually called the knowledge graph initially. Now today most people call it the knowledge panel. It's that informative panel of uh, uh, information or facts about a particular entity that appears on the right hand side of a search result in Google and in most other search engines now. It includes the structured data that it's obtained from, its, uh, from the underlying knowledge graph, uh, a description which in this case has been pulled from Wikipedia, some factual information about dates and places etc etc. And it's not limited to uh, um, scholarly information or um, deep um, academic research, etc. We can uh, we can talk in a knowledge panel about uh, somebody who's dearly loved by the uh, the library industry, uh, uh, Mr. Ranganathan here. Equally, we can describe somebody uh, who actually isn't a real person. Uh, it's a character born on April the fourth, first, nineteen seventy nine. Bart Simpson, a, a cartoon character, but the principle is the same. Bart Simpson is an entity and there's some factual information about it. And by navigating your way around the knowledge graph, by following the links in these, these entities, you can travel from entity to entity. So for instance, Nancy Cartwright is linked from Bart Simpson with a play-by relationship and can, we can see that Nancy Cartwright uh, has various images, etc. Et uh, we can follow a link to Dayton, Ohio as an entity, which is where she was born, and we can follow a link from Dayton, Ohio to the Dayton Aviation Heritage National Park uh, as, as, a, as a point of interest, place of interest associated with Dayton. So we've got from Bart Simpson to Dayton uh, Aviation Heritage National Park in three clicks. Uh, both. Uh, places or forms of entertainment that I would recommend. I like Bart Simpson as a bit of light entertainment. And if you want to spend a day at an excellent place with uh, artifacts from uh, the Wright brothers' uh, early attempts at flight through to ballistic missiles and, and NASA spacecraft, I couldn't recommend this one more highly. Anyway, back to the knowledge graph where this information is held. We don't really know um, how it's held inside the, the search engines organization, but they capture the descriptions of entities. Um, so there's an entity here um, with the name of Bart Simpson, but by following a play by relationship, we get to the entity, a person entity, Nancy Cartwright, and following a born in relationship, we end up looking at the data for an entity of Dayton, Ohio, and finally the place of interest um, relationship through to the uh, Aviation Heritage National Park. As you can see, the relationships are many and varied, played by born in place of interest. Uh, and these are the labels they, they put on the search engines, what actually happens inside the knowledge graph, uh, we're not really sure. But uh, it's, it's basic principles of structured data. Anybody familiar with RDF and, and uh, those sort of ontological techniques will recognize this pattern very well. So where does this information come from to populate the knowledge graphs that these search engines are, are running with? Well, in the early days, Google seeded their knowledge graph with, with data from something called Freebase. Freebase was, a, if you like, a data version of Wikipedia where people could openly contribute descriptions of things in a structured way. Uh, Google um, uh, absorbed Freebase um, through um, their company called MetaWeb uh, a few years ago and, and they used this to, to see the information. They also got information from their search logs. They can, they can infer from crawling various sites, uh, relationships between things, etc. They also pull information from well-known data sources, Wikipedia being the obvious one, uh, inferring information by harvesting those web pages. Increasingly, data is coming from Wikidata. Wikidata is a, uh, a, a data set that captures the factual information that um, lives uh, in the knowledge panels on uh, Wikipedia pages, the factual panels, which could be seen as uh, 
the forerunner of the, the knowledge panel that we're starting to see on the search engines and captures that information which they did over a period of time and now they reverse the process so many of those panels are actually populated from the Wikidata database. That, that is important because Wikidata has uh, uh, URI type identifiers for, for uh, concepts and facts etc and it is, it's a far greater data structure. And increasingly they're pulling this information from websites that are publishing schema.org markup within the website. Um, th this information is then processed uh, by uh, various entity extraction techniques, analysis techniques, and the entity is populated in the knowledge graph. Very often, uh, I believe, and it's, it's not a fact because I don't know these things, I may do some contracting from Google, but I've got no particular insight into what they do. Uh, but I, it is believed that information from many sources can be brought together to describe a particular entity. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the, the, the knowledge graph then is used to provo uh, power, provide data for things like the knowledge panel on, on the page that you get. Uh, also things like info boxes, increasingly today when you search on a search engine as well as the search results, you will very often uh, receive an information uh, panel which gives you a pricey of the topic that the search engine thinks you're looking for. So in this case, I, I was looking for Linux, the, uh, um, the operating system that's used on many servers. And before even getting any results, this knowledge panel was presented to me. So the, the search engine was answering the question and giving me some links immediately as part of my search experience. Equally, some of the information in the knowledge graph is, is used to uh, pair things like answer boxes. So this particular answer box uh, appeared when the search for how high is Mount Everest was typed in. So obviously there's some entity recognition going on in the search, but some of the information like the height of Mount Everest almost certainly is, is, is coming from the knowledge graph. And not to forget rich snippets. Rich snippets are still very important on the, uh, on the web and on the, on, the, on the search results pages. So the information that's in this, um, the, the knowledge graph is powering many ways that we're treating as normal now in our interactions with the search engine providing us more um, factual type information that we can navigate through, more discovering relationships as we navigate this data rather than having to search for things. So, schema.org. Its data is embedded in website HTML. That's, that's very, very important. That's not the only place you will find schema.org data, but it's, it's, it's the natural place to put it. This, this means that the data embedded using the serializations uh, that are offered to the webmasters, etc., is harvested by the search engines in normal web crawls. They don't have to go to a special server, they don't have to interact with a, a special API technique, etc. They harvest this data in exactly the same process, part of the same process that they use for their normal search crawling. The search crawling obviously identifies strings and uh, uh, etc on the page as well as the uh, structured data uh, and, and this has a benefit for the, the publisher of that data in that if you're uh, I don't know if you're selling a product for instance and you make a price change you can change that price within your Im uh, embedded schema.org data in the page and the next time the web crawler comes through, it will pick up that structured information. So how you describe the thing, how you improve the descriptions of things is, is under your control. You haven't got to post the data anywhere, very much like normal HTML page management. So schema.org is currently in use on over 10 million domains, and a domain is roughly equivalent to a website. So there's over 10 million sites already using schema.org markup in their pages. It's a broad vocabulary. Uh, version 2.2, which was released about 10 days ago, consists of 642 types, 992 properties, and uh, 219 
in enumeration values. So you've got a, a broad scope of types to describe most things that you will find on the web. It also has extensions published, uh, and we referred to these earlier. The first two are, are auto.schema.org for the automotive industry and bib.schema.org for the, for the bibliographic domain. These are fairly new to the environment and, and um, if you like, just finding their feet to part of the scheme the whole landscape. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, for, further down the line. So over its time from um, 2011 through to today, schema.org has established itself as a de facto vocabulary for describing structured data on the web. It's not the only vocabulary. Uh, there are many well-known vocabularies that are still used. Um, but if you were starting from scratch today and wanted to share data on the web for the search engines to pick up, uh, schema.org would be the obvious choice. And that is true for most industries. But I have been asked, so is it any good for bibliographic data and libraries? And this has been a question from the beginning. Uh, libraries, the bibliographic industry, have, have always been at the forefront of putting together the uh, vocabularies, putting together data formats, data structures, uh, for marking up metadata about their resources. They're very experienced in that, and it's very established as a way forward. So is schema.org useful for that area? Now, that's a question that was asked uh, back in 2012 by OCLC, OCLC, the Global Library Cooperative, 20,000 members, WorldCat, uh, their globally hosted search interface over 300 million plus bibliographic references, etc. Well known in the library industry, uh, and and also were with a, a fairly significant research arm. And the research arm back in 2012 were looking at both linked data and schema.org. Uh, and as you can see on this blog post from June in, in that year, uh, they announced adding link data to worldcat.org. So that means that all 300 million plus results pages in, in WorldCat had link data associated with them. Uh, and they used the schema.org vocabulary for this to see how that would A, be useful, and B, impact um, the, the, the use of the systems on the web. Uh, they embedded it <coughs> excuse me, in, in the bottom of the pages. Um, as I was saying, you embed structured data, schema.org structured data within the HTML, which almost de by definition means the user of the web page doesn't actually see it. But as this was a new initiative and people were exploring um, linked data, etc., what they also do and still do is at the bottom of any of the individual uh, reference pages within schema.org, uh, within WorldCat, they have this um, tab that if you click on, opens up and shows you the, uh, the schema or <coughs> another vocabulary markup. Uh, and as, as you can see uh, on, on this page, not everything is a schema.org property. There are things from something called library, etc. And this is demonstrating that there were gaps in, uh, in the vocabulary at that time. And part of this exercise was how useful is schema.org for bibliographic description at that time? Um, the answer, I believe, came back, it was surprisingly effective. Uh, there was a book type, there was an article type, there was a library type, author properties, this is all sounding very familiar from a bibliographic world. There was even a date published property uh, and an about property. Now, in the library community, many people would have thought to have had subject or topic or something like that. There's a general about property within schema.org which encompasses most of that. So it's, it's not exactly what you would want in the library world, but it's, it's a reasonable substitute in a, in a generic vocabulary. And there was also a genre property as well. But not everything in the garden was rosy, so not available at the time was a title property and still isn't. Um, if very initially that was, well, books have titles, uh, um, so we need a title property. But everything in the schema.org schema world has a name. And the title of a book 
is the name of the book in the general view of the world. Now, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, library catalogers listening to this who say, ah, but there's different sorts of titles and there's subtitles and all sorts of different kinds of titles, which is very important when we're cataloging and describing resources within libraries. If we're trying to share that information for discovery on the wider web, those differentiations aren't quite as important. So uh, a, a name property would suffice at that stage. But, um, there wasn't a creator property. Um, anybody familiar with the Dublin Core vocabulary would think that was a bit strange, but um, this was a high level look and we do possibly need some different creator types. There wasn't a place of publication property. There wasn't a, uh, um, that's interesting, I've both said that there was and there wasn't a date published property. There's obviously an error in my slides here and nobody's perfect, never mind. Uh, moving on, um, there wasn't the ability to describe a peer article, there wasn't the ability to de describe thesis or newspaper. And important for the library domain, there was no work relationship properties, the ability to re relate one instance of a work with another. In the library world, uh, people are probably familiar with functional requirements to bibliographic records, the structure that connects a, a, a work with a manifestation and an item expression, etc. There was none of that in, in the schema.org environment. So the conclusion was, even though it was surprisingly effective, there was a need for a library extension to the to, to schema in some way or other. So it looked like there needed to be some work to be um, in, embarked upon to make this useful. The obvious question is, uh, why bother? What's the point? What are we going to um, gain as a community? Um, um, OCLC is a co cooperative representing lots and lots of libraries. What would libraries gain from this kind of thing? Um, and in, in, it's worth going back to some first principles to answer this question. And I quite often in uh, workshops and presentations ask this question uh, of people in the library community. Why do we catalogue? Is it so that in, in previous years we could uh, assemble loads and loads of cards in nice looking drawers like this or uh, what was it to produce marked records etc. The real reason is so that we and our patrons can find things. Um, there's little point in cataloguing something unless you're going to go and look for it. Um, some people would disagree with that but in broad principles. So in today's era why should we share information on the web and it's so that today's user can find our things. So um, I, our users are, are, are not like this gentleman here, pulling out uh, nice um, wooden drawers and looking through catalogue cards. They're out in, in, in the real world. And, and where are those users out in the real world? Um, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but the answer is they're in the search engines. Uh, I use Google here as a collected noun for all the search engines that were here, but people open up their, uh, their tablet, they open up their iPhone, uh, they, they open up their web browser, they talk to Siri on their phone, etc. And effectively, where they are looking as a start point is going to be in the search engines like, like Google. So if we want to share our information with our potential consumers of that information, the place that we ideally want to be is where they are most of the time until they start to specialise at other reasons and go to specialised search interests. So where next was the question back in July 2012. So we kind of decided um, that we need to go forward. It wasn't just OCLC making this decision. Um, conversations in the community were obviously looking at where to go next. So the first option was what OCLC had done as part of their experiment. They created their own little library extension uh, to schema.org. Fairly clearly a localized vocabulary extension to a, a general purpose vocabulary is not an ideal way to progress. It's almost proprietary. Uh, it's not interacting. It becomes a responsibility of one organization to maintain it, etc. So that was dismissed fairly quickly. 
<coughs> the next option was library centric vocabularies. Um, there are many of them already out there. Dublin Core, RDA, Bibo, I'm sure many people listening to this could, could dream up some other ones. And there had been significant linked data work carried out using these vocabularies. So for instance, um, these organisations, the British Library, the German National Library, the Spanish Library, the S Swedish National Library, these are just examples of, of many uh, often national libraries that experimented with linked data. Uh, have had very successful linked data projects using um, library and bibliographic focused vocabularies. They all um, link to external authorities like uh, the Virtual International Authority file here to, to embed links to, to uh, add authority to the statements they make in their data sets. Equally, they link out to the Library of Congress for subject information and other name information, etc. They're, they're very good, all of them, structured representations of their library catalogues using linked data techniques, uh, often storing the IDF that they create in triple stores, etc. But apart from linking out for reference here, they do very little linking in between, and there's very little linking inwards into these environments. Uh, effectively, what has been created has been a set of open linked data silos. They're open because of licensing and access. If you go to the, the right end point or the right web page, you can gain information from them. But they don't interconnect. They kind of sit in isolation as silos. Now, in the, in the world that we're talking about with schema.org and the search engines, ideally the consumers that uh, the search engines satisfy the search needs of, ideally these organizations would love to be able to interact and connect to the information that's provided openly from, from these sites. But they all use subtly different data models. They all use subtly different combinations of the, uh, of the general vocabularies around. So effectively, they're, they're hidden behind a vocabulary barrier. There's nothing physical or even licensing-wise that stops you getting at the data. But in the vocabulary terms, they're all different and as well different from the wider world. So it was considered that that probably was not a way forward. The next approach was to um, approach a new library standard, perhaps. And at a similar time, the Library of Congress started their BibFrame initiative. BibFrame is uh, an RDF-based vocabulary, as you can see from their, their drawing here. It's, it's talking about entities, works, subjects, creators, publishers, etc., and the relationships between them. And from their early doc documentation, they were talking about it being the foundation for the future of bibliographic description, an eventual replacement for Mark 21, the de facto cataloging standard and, and record format currently within the library industry, to identify information entities. I put the emphasis on the word information there because uh, a mark record, uh, a bibliographic description, tends to be an entity in its own right in the library community. And what they're talking about here is focusing on those information entities, which is very similar but not quite the same as focusing on the entities that those uh, records describe, the people, the places, the events, uh, the organisations. Uh, the focus in the wider world tends to be less on the information entities rather than the uh, enter these themselves. One of the main drivers, conversion for mark. There are hundreds of millions of mark records on the planet. So if we're going to move forward in the library industry into a new data format, conversion has to be a major step in that environment. And having conversion from an old, uh, still very powerful, but nevertheless uh, aged format that is record-based towards an environment where describing entities and relationships there's, there's an inevitably going to be some compromises in, in the inventory target format. It's published in RDF, therefore it's, um, it, it, it's a linked data format. And it's an approach that's still very valid and, and still important in the library industry. But as to sharing data with the wider web, um, it, it's not the ideal format. It suffers from the same problem as the previous one. It's not the standard everybody else is, is using. So even if you publish BibFrame from uh, your library site, it's not the same format that the rest of the web is trying to use. So we've moved on beyond that. 
So the next route was um, proposing enhancement to schema.org, proposing extensions to schema.org. Uh, and how are we going to go about that? The, um, the community around schema.org is a very open community. It may be backed by the major search engines, but it runs in a very open environment associated with W3C for uh, community groups and those kind of things. Uh, and anybody can propose and usually have their proposal seriously um, analysed by the group for anything in any environment. So how we were going to move forward, it was clear to me personally that it needed to be an industry initiative. I'd been speaking to various organisations and, and, and individuals in the library industry and took note of what Google and the others were doing with schema.org and took note of what OCLC were experimenting with and it was clear that there was definitely some promise in trying to move forward in a bibliographic way on schema.org. So um, I took the initiative to set up a W3C community group myself uh, with the uh, wonderful name of Schema Bibex, then often shortened to um, Schema Bibex. It's a group that grew to uh, uh, approximately 80 people with a focus on pulling together proposals to gain consensus on them and then push them forward as proposal to schema.org. Again, I'm often asked, what's it like working in a community group, especially when you've got sort of 80 uh, people? And the best description I, I can add is, it's, well, it's like herding cats. When, when you've got a group of passionate, intelligent, experienced, motivated people looking at something uh, like a vocabulary definition, uh, inevitably you will get um, differences of opinion, differences of approach and, and the need to visit things often. However, I kind of love herding cats because it's all about working towards a consensus. If a very small group of people come up with a proposal and it gets adopted by an organisation like Schema.org, inevitably there will be a group that will turn up later on and say, well, if you'd have thought about this in a slightly different way, it could have satisfied all these use cases as well. And when you're operating in such an environment where, uh, with, with various people, operating on mailing lists, operating in a community group, etc., what one of the sort of de facto rules that reigns is silence equates to consent. Usually you find motivated people, with one or two exceptions, motivated people will only speak up uh, when they see something they don't like in these proposals. Fortunately, there are a few that will promote and discuss, etc., etc. But uh, a group like this uh, kind of grinds to a halt um, if you if you're looking for consent from from every member. And in schema.org groups, especially, and this is something I've discovered with many of the organisations and community groups I've been involved with, and this is kind of slightly counterintuitive you end up with a group of very experienced, motivated people. But the best way to approach uh, extending schema.org for your particular sector is start, and I don't mean always, but start by leaving your experience at the door. What that means is your start position is take a look at schema.org as it is today, as it is now, and address the resources in your world that you want to describe and see how well you can do with schema.org itself. What that does is uh, take away the shopping list of types and properties in your mind from your own world and say, well, how do my resources relate to the generic types and properties that are already available? Which then means you identify the gaps that you need to fill. And when you're identifying these gaps, again, you have to be careful not to bring too much domain knowledge with you. Is this type or property that you're proposing relevant to the web or is this uh, something you always um, manage and keep information on in your own world but it's not really relevant to the wider web. It may help you run your environment or it may run, help you run a very, very specialised search engine for instance but in the general wider, wider web is this item relevant? Similarly, will it then aid discovery? 
the, the whole idea of sharing this information with the wider world is so people can discover the resource that you're describing and end up back in your environment looking at that resource when, uh, where you can provide extra information, etc. So the, the group travelled for about two years, making some proposals on the way, and I would suggest that almost on its second anniversary, uh, its, it's um, if you like, visibility of success was this blog post from the schema.org group, uh, talking about the support for bibliographic relationships and periodicals being added to the schema.org vocabulary. So the, uh, the highlights along the route, this doesn't sound much like a highlight, less commercial wording, but it actually was quite a valuable step forward. Um, schema.org originally was put together by search engines who were very concentrated on commerce, etc. And some of the wording in the descriptions of the types and the properties the, and their use with, within schema.org definitely had a, a, a commercial bent. So when an offer was made by an organization to supply something, it was described as an offer to sell. Uh, the, the relationships between the offering, uh, the offer and the organization use the property seller. Now, the relationship's identical, but the, the wording, even though one shouldn't take too much notice of property names and type names, but the wording was definitely too commercial for the library world. So it referenced to sell, loan, uh, rent, etc., uh, in, in those kind of relationships. Citation. Citation was actually in the vocabulary, very buried in a specialised medical scholarly article type down in the depths of the vocabulary. And, and we encouraged it to be brought right up to, to the top end of the creative work vocabulary so you could cite most things. Uh, work relationships. So this is the FERBA uh, relationships that we were looking for in the library world. It is a lot more loose than uh, Ferber itself. So any creative work can be seen to be an example of another creative work. So in library terminology, this manifestation, this particular version of a book with a particular ISBN, can be seen as being a, an example of the creative work of, say, War and Peace or, or whatever. And the relationships can operate in the other direction. Uh, plus periodical publication issue, publication volume. This gave us the ability to describe an article in context if you wanted to. Nothing uh, enforced in schema.org, but if you wanted to, you could describe an article within a volume, within an issue of, of, of a scholarly journal, periodical, for instance. Also, uh, multi-volume works, so it, it provided the ability to say one work is part of another. So the Two Towers is part of the multi-volume work of, of Lord of the Rings, for instance. That capability became uh, very useful and they has part and is part of properties that enable the, have, have enabled the description of creative works of all sorts of types to, uh, to, to be expanded. And finally, provided many examples into schema.org. On the schema.org site, every property, every type should and I say should, we're trying to get there, have at least one example of how the markup for this would appear in the real world. Many bibliographic examples now live with those. So uh, um, an example for offered by went in recently, etc. So they were some achievements. But as within uh, many areas, there's always people want more. Um, people will continue to propose enhan enhancements. And the problem you've got, the more enhancements you provide, you tend to be sector specific, maybe too bibliographic or library focused, uh, or do we need an extension vocabulary for schema.org separate from the vocabulary itself? Uh, and that's where bibliograph.net came from. It came from a desire within OCLC to extend schema for some more specific library things without losing the benefit of schema. Uh, and bibliograph.net was created as a, um, an extension vocabulary to, uh, to schema. It was created for OCLC, but not as a proprietary for their own use only. It was created for the community. It's open, it's got the same license as schema.org, etc. Uh, comments and suggestions with what were encouraged. And for an extension, all types within it were subtypes of schema types, all properties were schema properties. 
uh, and that the domain specific types and properties were built in that way for web sharing. Still the how will this help this to be, uh, um, be discovered etc appeared in there and some of the types and properties are, are, are some obvious candidates and for some future schema.org proposals. So moving on a little bit further, um, schema.org 2.0 appeared in May of this year and the, the key issue with schema.org 2.0 was it introduced the extension mechanism an extension mechanism to enable reviewed and hosted extensions to, to be created. It meant that they were reviewed by the schema.org community and actually hosted on the schema.org site. Uh, um, and therefore you would end up with a namespace for the description of vocabulary as something.schema.org. Equally, the mechanism was there for external extensions, which enabled you to use an external namespace so you could have a schema extension as a schema of myorganization.com, which brought us to the creation of bib.schema.org, one of the, the, the first two hosted extensions that appeared on, at the same time in schema.org 2.1, bib for the bibliographic world, auto for the automotive world. Uh, um, the contents of the bibschema.org proposal was was made up from schema bibx proposals, some bibliograph.net types and proposals, and some proposals from the comic community who kind of came into the schema bibx group and, and put forward some of their proposals uh, that were very parallel to the kind of thing we were talking about uh, in the bibliographic world. It made obvious sense to keep them together. The, the review process wasn't really onerous, but term names and description tweaks were made by the core schema.org group to avoid conflicts, to maybe have things uh, library specific so they didn't use a term that could be used generally, etc. And they made one specific recommendation to drop a proposed agent type. Agent in the bibliographic world being either a person or an organization. Uh, across in the wider world, this didn't make quite so much sense in all areas and, and, and could be achieved in, in other ways. So bib.schema.org, this is the home page of bib.schema.org. Uh, if we take a look on it, we can see that the terms, there are 11 types defined, atlas, audio book, ch chapter, etc. Newspaper thesis have finally arrived in there. Properties, abridged, uh, Inca and Lettera, that's very common oriented. Uh, work translation and translation of work, so we can relate creative works together via their translations uh, and an enumeration value. Um, and this is how they fit into the structure of uh, schema.org itself. Um, the, the, the items in, in, um, in blue being the extensions in the environment and the ones in red are what sits in schema.org. This is a compressed view that you can get when you list all types on the schema.org type just to see uh, what, what was in, in that environment. So adding these things has added even more capability of describing um, bibliographic-ish, it's quite a broad term when it's employed in this environment, bibliographic information to um, uh, the, the wider generic vocabulary. So that's where we've kind of arrived at today. So the, then, the next obvious question I get asked is, well, is it being used? Well, apart from the vocabulary itself being on over 10 million sites, uh, bibliographic examples are appearing across the web. I've just picked some uh, ones that have leapt to mind here. Uh, obviously, WorldCat with its 330-odd million, I think, resources now described uh, using schema.org. Um, uh, is an obvious source of this information. The AF, the Virtual International Authority file, uh, has had schema.org added over the recent months, so the authorities are now starting to be described using the schema.org vocabulary. LibHub, the initiative uh, mostly in the United States to, to harvest data from libraries and then republish it using schema.org and BibFrame is, is becoming a, a source of this information. Europeana in Europe, uh, not making heavy use of schema.org, but they do use schema.org to help their resources get discovered. Uh, open source library systems, Evergreen and COA, also have the ability to output this kind of information. 
Um, National Library Board of Singapore are doing some stuff around their newspapers in this kind of area. Goodreads as, as a book recommendation site is using these kind of things a little bit in Open Library. Uh, and individual libraries, I just picked a couple here, Denver Public Library and the Laurentian University in Canada, all starting to publish um, schema.org. Um, so going back to the title of this presentation, and uh, you know, it's not so much a statement as, as, a, as a question. Is it fit for bibliographic purpose? Well, with the schema.org vocabulary as enhanced over the three or four years since its inception, with the addition of the bibliographic schema, uh, with the, um, uh, the small contribution in the background of bibliograph.net, is I think it is. The vast majority of things that you would want to say to the wider world about a bibliographic resource can be said with the combination of those things all based around schema.org. And the vast majority of that is actually in the schema.org vocabulary. So I think the answer to that particular question is yes. We have the vocabulary tools to describe bibliographic resources on the web for broad discovery. But don't confuse that with the ability to replace my metadata exchange. That's a more specific task. Uh, I always say you, you couldn't run a library on schema.org. It's not detailed enough. But get the web to discover your resources, well, that's, that's a, a, a different task. So finally, leading forward, kind of what's next? Well, implementation is next. I put up some examples of organisations providing schema.org, but it's still fairly small quantities in the, in, in the wider web. And, and these uh, techniques and the vocabulary need to be implemented by system suppliers, web, web publishers, etc., in, in the library domain, exactly as, as it should be in other domains where similar activities are going on. We're, we're fairly early on the adoption curve, but uh, as more and more organizations start to share this data that's then harvested into the knowledge graph so the search engines can direct people and interlink the contacts and entities, it will become a virtuous circle of, of, of application in that environment as the resources we describe using schema.org become part of the graph. And there's another much more local step, and that is in, in two weeks' time we have... Um, and the second part, whoops, where's that gone? Typical, typical. Last slide and things get out of step. Let me get this back up by, by promoting the second part, here we go, of, of this, this webinar, Extended Potential Possibilities. This is going to be picking up on the themes from this particular webinar, uh, using some of the experience gained of working with people uh, and, and organisations, talking about how you would implement schema.org, how you would extend it, how you could run a localised copy on your, your own computer so you can test out extending the vocabulary, how you can then share that with the wider world for comment, how you then propose it to the main schema.org group and, and other community groups. This is the kind of work that uh, has, has let me see the benefits of schema.org and, and that I like to share with various organisations that engage me to help in, in this environment. So looking forward to that. It's going to be a little bit more technical and a little bit more practical. Uh, I'm actually going to try and do some online stuff live, which is always dangerous on the webinar. So if you like people living on the edge, come just for that. But it's not going to be too technical, uh, and I would imagine most people are going to get something out of it. So I look forward to many of you joining me in two weeks' time. So that's me finished for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. So um, I'd like to invite everybody to write questions in the uh, question box. Um, and while you're doing that, um, I'll start off with a question. Um, at, on one of your slides, you said that um, schema.org has um, 642 types, 992 properties, and 219 values. Can you elaborate on uh, what these, what the values are? What's the nature of these? Um, Okay, the, a, a value or an enumeration value, to take its uh, official name uh, within the vocabulary, is something you assign to a type when you're describing it 
Uh, a good example is uh, book format type. Book format type is a, uh, a type within schema.org and its subtypes are these enumeration values. So there's one for ebooks, there's one for hardback, there's one for paperback, and recently through bib.schema.org there's one now for graphic novel. So, so there are some fixed um, values, the kind of thing you will find in, this, in a thesaurus. The, the, the issue with schema.org though is it doesn't want to become the central hub of defined values for the whole world. It does, uh, theoretically following that pattern you could have introduced the whole of the Library of Congress subject headings into schema.org which I don't think anybody wants and definitely the people within schema.org does not want the onerous task of maintaining those. But these are some very obvious um, order status values, book format types, etc. But the mechanism within schema.org also allows you to then reference uh, external identifiers. So this is often done on the about property on a creative work where you would reference a Library of Congress subject heading or say that this autobiography is about and then they use the URI to reference that person within the Virtual International Authority file or something like that. Okay, we have a question here. Is schema.org affecting SEO, search engine optimization? There are controversial opinions and tests about this. Okay, I mean, SEO by its name is search engine optimization. Schema.org is there to provide structured data uh, to allow um, people to discover and explore by relationships. So the, the two things, your search result and if your entity that you're talking about appear on the same page, they're obviously going to reinforce you. If you've got information displayed in a knowledge panel or in an answer box or something like that, it's obviously naturally going to direct people back to your resources, which is the overall concept. The knowledge graph the search engines um, never make specific statements about these kind of things, but the search engines uh, place great inference on the fact that it shouldn't affect the, res the search result position of a standard search result. Uh, and when people are looking at SEO, the other three-letter acronym people often use uh, is um, KPI, Key Performance Indicators. And Counterintuitively at first, successful structured data can often detrimentally affect your key performance indicator. If in an answer box your company's phone number appears and the, the person rings you direct from that information, they will not have travelled to your website. They, uh, if the address is the same, they will not have travelled to your website. They, they may have picked up a map on their phone, they haven't travelled to your website. Yet that information has actually positively affected the number and quality of relationships between your organisation and the eventual consumer. So SEO and schema.org and structured data on the web are very close bedfellows, but it's dangerous to conflate them, uh, especially when you're looking at focusing in on specific website performance indicators. Okay, is schema.org uh, work only in English language? How about uh, Spanish uh, or uh, Library of Spain? Okay, the, the vocabulary itself, so the names of the properties and the names of the terms are based around the English language. Uh, and effectively, the de facto the de facto language of computing and, uh, and that in the world. The, the markup that is supplied around those terms obviously can be in any language, in any script. So there is no problem from that point of view. Ideally, we would like, um, and I'm, I'm aware of this from um, working with the team at, at Google and with other organizations, ideally we would like the schema.org site which describes what a property is, some examples, uh, and uh, what the uh, types are, etc. It'd be great if those descriptions could appear in other languages. The, at the moment, there, doesn't, there isn't the community impetus around doing that. I've seen um, some examples around where um, Oriental Scripts, of, I can't remember which one it was now, 
uh, translations of those descriptions, but it's a living, breathing vocabulary, so we get a release every couple of months at the moment, and keeping up with translations is a challenge. We would like it to be, and if anybody wants to come in and, and, and talk to um, Schema.org and propose uh, that they place in the GitHub uh, a translation of those descriptions in any other uh, popular language or even an unpopular one. Uh, I, I, I think that initiative would, would be greeted positively. I think there needs to be a bit of work. The site needs to tweak slightly so that we can pull in these other language definitions. But uh, uh, if, if we got some popular translations in there, that would be a good uh, initiative which would be welcomed. Okay, we have some related questions here which I'll try to kind of um, uh, put together uh, about the relationship between schema.org, uh, BibFrame, and Mark. So um, there are automated ways to convert from Mark to BibFrame. Is there, are there ways to do that for schema.org? And the related question is, um, uh, so to share um, uh, to share on the web and have the structure that libraries run on, um, do we need to use bibschema.org uh, um, uh, and bibframe together? It's 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 a complicated question which has been asked many times, but basically it, the the answer is it depends what you want to do. Um, if you're replacing the in-depth cataloging processes. Uh, of, of a, um, a, an academic library or a national library or whatever, you will need the structure uh, and, and um, capability that something like Mark gives you. Uh, Mark, the ambition of BibFrame is to replace Mark in a, a structured way, and by structured I mean entity-based with relationships between them. So rather than creating a record about a book, you will create a uh, uh, an entity description for a work related to an entity description for a person related to an entity description for a subject, etc., etc. Uh, you can have automated ways that will transform, and there are some experimental ones around that will transform Mark in, into BibFray. And it almost by definition, what you end up with is a record-oriented view of the data. Uh, you can start pulling those things together and start building real real entities. Uh, and the key, actually, is to get your data into an entity. And once it's in an RDF format, uh, outputting the data in schema or BibFrame or both becomes a comparatively, note the word comparatively, simple process. So if you like, a serious library that does... Um, heavyweight cataloging really needs to consider what internal format they use, uh, what um, what formats they want to accept and what formats they 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 want to export. Effectively, Schema.org and BibFrame are approaching different ends of the same spectrum of who wants to consume the data, and there's massive overlap in the middle. Uh, so, the key from my point of view, my recommendation is people need to start looking towards creating entity and re relationships in their data as they move away from, from mark records. Over, over a period of time. There are conversion scripts that, uh, that happen um, to create schema at all from, from Mark. In fact, uh, OCLC use them because um, they're publishing schema.org um, because schema.org is not a solid vocabulary. Uh, BibFrame is still evolving. The community is evolving. I know OCLC are actively involved in that community. Uh, to improve and bring these things together. But because they, they've gone for an entity relationship-based environment, it doesn't matter too much which particular vocabulary you start with. You can always output the one you need for the correct circumstance or even both. And you may not even have to hold the data in, in either of those vocabularies as long as you can transform to it on the way out. I think that probably answered the question, but I'm sure people will come back to me if they want. Uh, there are some questions here about the relationship between schema.org and the extensions. For example, why are health and medical types within schema.org and not within an extension? What do you do when something in an extension should have been in the main schema.org body? Okay, well, I'll, I'll take the, the first part of that question first. Health is in there because there was no extension concept at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, we're in the process at the moment uh, and the, the 
the people behind the, the, the health part of schema.org are in the process of building an initial health.schema.org extension, which is actually going to pull a lot of the medical entities out of the core vocabulary and drop them into an extension. Uh, there's, no, there's a negotiation between people proposing the extensions and the core group about what goes in and what's out. So uh, coincidentally, this morning I was reviewing some of the health proposals uh, and suggesting that maybe hospitals should be left in the core rather than taken into the extension uh, because it's more generally applicable, etc. Uh, the extensions are, are, are there to uh, suggest uses communities to focus people in on particular areas. It's not there for you to pr prevent uh, use across boundaries. Uh, and what I'll explain in the next part of the, the webinar is even though a property like or a type like audiobook is in bib.schema.org, its URI is schema.org slash audiobook. So it's all in a flat, flat namespace which enables uh, uh, everything to interact. So the extensions are more there to corral things together for viewing uh, application and analysis rather than structured vocabulary. And already I've seen proposals where people have put something in an extension proposal and it's been picked up by the main group and say, well, hang on, that, that would make sense to be in the core because it needs to be more, more generally visible to the people dipping into schema.org looking out to mark their data up. Okay, we have a time for about four more questions here. One of them is, um, can access rights be expressed with bibschema.org um, for ebooks or audiobooks? Uh, I believe it can for regular schema.org uh, for video. So just wondering if it also uh, for bibschema.org. If, 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 a, if a property is available in the core vocabulary, there's no restrictions on using it in the extension. So as I said in my previous answer, it's all in a flat namespace. So if that property makes sense to be part of a, um, um, a, a type, be it in the core or one of the extensions, you, you, uh, you can uh, um, use it. I can't remember where that particular property comes. I've got a feeling. Uh, it, it will be in one of the subtypes of, of creative work. It, it may make sense to have an extension proposal or an update proposal to broaden its, its domain so it could live in on, a, uh, on an audio book or an e-book or, or, or something like that. It's, it's very flexible and as I say, this is a living vocabulary. So if there's an anomaly like that that people believe should be addressed, get onto the schema.org uh, um, list and make a suggestion and, and, and it can be pro, um, proposed. Okay. For future-proofing um, our, our HTML markup and maximizing utility, are we best served providing data in JSON-LD, RDFA, or microdata? Um, <laughs> This is one of those questions that dropped into what did I refer it to as the almost religious wars about the best format uh, earlier on. Um, the, the backing organisations are supporting all three markups and, and intend to um, into the future. How far into the future, I can't predict. And it, a lot depends on how your page is, is actually constructed by the system that, that's doing it. If, if it's easier to put a blob of data at the end, uh, it sounds to me like JSON-LD would be a really, really good idea. That, that is being adopted by the search engines. I don't think it's got full 100% coverage for every type and property yet, but it's gradually getting there. Microdata and RDFA being the um, the more established version, JSON-LD was only added, well, I can't remember exactly, a couple of years back, something like that. But it's totally up to the, to the user. The, the search engine crawlers uh, recognize any of those formats. So um, um, it doesn't matter to them. Here's a very specific question, but uh, maybe it has a general aspect as well, and that is what's, what has happened to the idea of supporting conference proceedings within periodical? Um, I don't know is the simple answer to that question. Uh, I can probably uh, do some looking up to find out. Uh, if, if it was proposed and it's, um, it's not been accepted, I would suggest it's probably because the people behind the proposal have, have not been actively backing it on the mailing list. 
the the um, the schema.org open community for proposals is is a very active mailing list. So if you have a proposal that you think is important, obviously uh, you you make a proposal, but then you need to be prepared to sort of back it by uh, providing uh, some examples of how it might look, and and eventually what the um, the structured markup that creates schema.org, which is very simple bits of RDFA, would look like to create that property. And and some comment on who's going to use it. If it's if it's a proposal for identifying three-legged moles in Scotland, it may sound like a very good proposal, but nobody's going to use it, therefore it's not going to get adopted, people are not going to do the effort. If you feel that something like conference proceedings, which sounds like a good idea to me, uh, needs pushing forward in the community, uh, dive in, propose, push, and try and get some supporters for it. How can librarians contribute to the development of schema.org? by providing a hell of a lot of the valuable data that should be shared on the web and being open-minded uh, about how the data that they create were, should be shared on the web and what is the eventual goal of that. Is it to uh, identify resources that would satisfy the needs of their potential users and, and consumers or, or is it um, to just add value to the your local search interface. There's a trade-off between those kind of things. So uh, uh, a, a librarian needs to be talking to their system builder or the system provider, depending on whether they, they buy the system or develop the row, so that um, uh, they, they're pushing all the time saying, we're putting all this valuable work into describing our resources and cataloging them, etc. How are you, as my provider going to make that visible on the web so that my users who are increasingly out there not stood in my reading room or, or accessing my, my localized search interface, how are those people going to find out that those resources exist in my library? Keep, keep abreast of these kind of things. Don't, it's easy to say, but don't be frightened of the change from a cataloging environment uh, based on records to one that's based on entities with, with these uh, linked data style uh, vocabulary. It's a natural evolution and actually replicates some of the developments that went on in libraries years ago. When, when librarians invented authorities and, and authority files held by global sites, we almost invented linked data, but not quite. Uh, so a lot of the concepts, a lot of the principles are already there underlying what libraries do. So keep aware of what's going on. Uh, and, and, and track developments. And from schema.org point of view, don't just understand that your catalog needs schema.org, your website needs schema.org, your databases need schema.org, your events need schema.org, and they need all linking together. So when uh, a book is offered by a library, the link is to your library website, which also has schema.org in it, which has embedded address information and links to the library events, etc., etc. You have to build a graph of relationships for your world that the outside world can absorb and part, make it part of the global knowledge graph, which they can uh, direct people around to satisfy their needs. Okay, I'm going to close here with. Um, uh, two, I think, closely related questions, um, and uh, with apologies for um, questions that, I, uh, that I've overlooked or um, uh, that we don't have time for. Um, so the questions, uh, closing with these questions, so DSpace has been um, successful in getting Google to, to crawl their sitemaps and to get it included in Google searches. How, how far are we from that? Um, uh, with our library catalogs. And the related question is, um, um, are there rich snippets specifically for uh, bibliographic data? I'll take the second part first and say, as far as I'm aware, no, there isn't. There is, even though bibliographic data is starting to become popular, there's not that, uh, in comparative terms, that many uh, uh, book types or article types that, that are out there which would naturally fit into rich snippets. It's, it, the, the more that's out there, the more liable the rich snippet people are going to be to build a rich snippet for a particular type they find in the knowledge graph. Um, as, as against uh, DSpace um, getting the, the search engines to crawl their site, 
uh, which is obviously the benefit with this. Is it's no good embedding schema.org in a web page if it's not being crawled. And, and this is where in, in the library catalog environment, some of the catalogs, some of the search interfaces on top of library catalogs are built on technology that makes it difficult for the search engines to crawl. Equally, there has been a tradition in the library domain where libraries have actually prevented uh, the search engines crawling their data uh, uh, for political reasons in a, with a small p over the years. Uh, the fear of Google harvesting their data and taking their business away, etc. So the combination of those two facts means uh, a significant proportion of um, library catalog interfaces out on the web today are not being crawled by the search engines. And one of the moves that we have to make, which uh, I'll give credit to the open source community with their library systems and, and, and some of the stuff OCLC have done and one or two other organisations, is to make those catalog interfaces crawlable and then embed the schema.org so the search engines can, can pick them up. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, we've reached the end of our time. Um, I hope to see uh, many of you um, in two weeks for the continuation of this discussion when we look more closely at the extension mechanism. And um, I'd like to um, hand the microphone back to Stefan of ACIST for uh, some closing words. Thank you, Tom. Um, for all the attendees still on the webinar, we would like to let you know that this recording and archived slides will be made available within 48 hours of today's live presentation. So please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with links to the recorded webinar and slides. And that is all from me. And thank you, Richard, and thank you, Tom, and thank you to our attendees for attending today's webinar. And have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you all.